Hey everybody, I think Facebook is telling me I'm live now, which is good. So if you guys wanted to hit like or comment and uh, let me know if you can see me well, you can hear me well. I'm not seeing a place to look at any comments. Um, oh no, I guess I am. Yeah, so... I'm going to wait till about 10 o'clock and you're going to have to look at my ugly mug until, uh, until it's time to start, maybe even 10.05. Hey, if you are watching right now, can you um, just drop a comment in the feed and let me know you can see me well and you can hear me well or not? Um, I would greatly appreciate that. Oh, thank you, Irene. I appreciate you. So she says she can hear and see me well. Sorry about the seeing part, but I'm glad you can hear me. <laughs> I miss you and Patrick. Say hi to Patrick for me. I am going to scroll back up to the video so I won't be able to see people's comments. Um, so just be aware of that as we go along here. <laughs> I'm getting texts as well, which I appreciate. We're just waiting till about it's 10 now, so we'll wait till about 10.03 or so for those people that always come in late to church. <laughs> Hi, Susan and John. Good to see you here. I cheated and scrolled back down to comments so I don't have to look at my face. Looks like we got about three people on right now. I've got the homeless people already, uh, workers asking me about our coats and jackets. Uh, Let's see, we still need jackets, socks, blankets, uh, hats, and I'm replying back to them. Hats, and what was the other thing we were doing? Jackets, socks, blankets, hats, and, oh, shoes. All right, it was actually Bill Francis from our sister church in Martinez. Um, who's going to join us in trying to resource the homeless in our community. They actually share the same core homeless outreach team as us, which is really cool. And so um, they're going to start a drive, too, to try and help the homeless because it's really bad out there right now. So thank you guys for your donations. Uh, as I said earlier, if you, as you log on here this morning, if you could hit like, down below somewhere in here and um, maybe drop a comment to let us know you're here that would be absolutely wonderful it'd make me feel good while I'm sitting here alone in my beautiful dining room and and doing a live stream <clears throat> looks like we've got about eight people on now we're gonna start up in a few minutes of modern technology.
Okay, well, I think I'm going to go ahead and start this morning. And so thank you guys for being here. This is the first ever completely online, um, no in-person, even camera crew uh, uh, message delivered from First Christian Church. Um, basically due to me. <laughs> so it's a little weird to be sitting here, but it's kind of nice too. And I promise you, this is somewhat inappropriate, but I promise you I'm wearing pants and it's not pajama pants. Okay. So that's, that's an important thing to know. I'm sure you were concerned. Okay. Let me get over to my message sheet here. So I did want to just welcome everybody for being here this morning. And again, if you're um, just tuning in, if you could hit like down below and leave a comment, um, I would greatly appreciate it. I'm filming this from my, I'm live streaming this from my dining room table. Um, so uh, it's weird not to be in front of people. This is the first time I've ever done this uh, as a live stream anyway. And so I'd greatly appreciate knowing you're here. Um, unfortunately, due to a possible COVID exposure, we're not holding in-person services today as hopefully you knew ahead of time but thanks to modern technology we're able to carry on uh, connecting with each other online here in this space this morning it's strange to be doing this without being in front of y'all to be sure um, so make sure again you hit that like and comment um, on the sermon as we go uh, for full disclosure i just wanted to say the possible COVID exposure was actually from me <laughs> And so uh, I felt like, uh, I know typically in a business setting, um, you're just saying you are exposed and you protect the privacy of people. I'm a little bit different that way, so I'm just letting you know it was me. Um, I've had a bad cold for over a week now, but um, I had tested negative uh, before the sermon last week. And then I tested just minutes before I walked out the door for the Christmas Eve service too. And both times I tested negative and they were county health tests, not your generic over-the-counter tests. I have connections. And so I was just trying to be extremely careful with even just with a cold because I wanted to protect everybody. And I think that's important. Our family is all fully vaccinated and um, just being cautious to take care of people. Um, I'm glad I did test negative just minutes before I left the Christmas Eve service because we have that record at least. And so you can be assured if you were at the Christmas Eve service, it's highly unlikely I was carrying COVID, though it's possible. And um, I, with just with the cold, luckily, I made sure I didn't shake anybody's hand or, you know, get too close to anybody. And I warned everybody about my cold. But I do have family out here visiting from Maryland. And they tested negative the day before coming out here. Uh, but one of them woke up uh, and uh, was sick. And yesterday is COVID positive. <laughs> So ironically, um, uh, the best laid plans are often fail in this COVID craziness though. And ironically, I'm feeling way better. Um, and my head cold is actually still here, but it's clearing a little bit. So the last two days have been better. And uh, the family member that's sick here is not, uh, has a cold, basically cold or flu-like symptoms and a little queasiness today. And today is his birthday. <laughs> so we're just going to pamper him all day long. So just be, please be in prayer for us and for everyone who came in contact with me on Christmas Eve. Pray for our health to be protected and our sick family member just exhibiting signs of a bad cold and that he would get better. And cozy up on your couch or wherever you're tuning in from and, and let's allow God's word to encourage us in our faith together this morning. So let me pray. Father, I do thank you for this morning. I thank you for the technology to send out your gospel no matter where or how um, we do that. And I pray this morning would uh, your words would bless people with a greater increasing knowledge of who you are and your kingdom drawing near to us. Uh, protect those that are sick. Protect our household this morning and um, any other household that's sick. And um, we just ask for some sort of... Uh, return to abnormality, <laughs> the abnormal normal in our day-to-day -day lives. This has been quite the stretch as I realize we're closing in on the end of our second year uh, with this COVID pandemic. Uh, thank you for everyone who's tuned in this morning, and I just pray that this message would go out into the world and teach people more about you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, 
Today, hold on a second, let me get this cough drop out of my mouth. Today we'll be um, continuing our study through the Gospel of Luke at Luke 19, uh, verses 11 through 27, if you'd like to open your Bibles to that, and we'll read that. Sorry about that. Um, I do want to let you know today's a tough passage. It's, uh, I think it's the toughest passage maybe in the New Testament, the toughest thing that Jesus ever says. But it's a tough passage, too, I think, because it's the last encounter we have recorded of Jesus um, interacting with people before he enters Jerusalem, that triumphal entry, uh, Palm Sunday we celebrate. And uh, that will mark the last week of his life. And he knows that going in, right? He's God. And so I got to imagine he was getting increasingly frustrated, maybe increasingly worried. I mean, we do have him... Uh, very anxious and crying tears of blood in the garden just before um, he was arrested, right? So we know he had some uh, anxiety or uh, like, I don't want to put uh, human words on or feelings on God, but we know he was affected. And so you can see this actually in his teachings from here uh, on out through the rest of the Gospel of Luke. You can see that he is getting more frustrated and more aggressive in how he teaches because he knows that uh, his end, his time is drawing to an end. And we'll certainly see that in today's passage. It's interesting that um, we're at this passage in Luke 19, the last passage before Jesus enters Jerusalem in a few days, just a few days before we enter into our new year of 2022 ourselves. 2022. I think he was crucified around um, 33 AD, and so that's almost 2,000 years ago, and yet his truth and his way, his truth and his life continues to pour out into the world. Um, but I do think, uh, it does make me think, what has ministry at First Christian uh, Church accomplished over this last year, right? What was Jesus accomplishing? I'm sure he was thinking that too. And where are we going to go in the new year as we journey through our faiths together, I think Jesus was probably thinking, where will this go? Eh, he knows where it'll go. He's God, but, you know, <laughs> he's going to turn it over to 12, which will rapidly become 11 um, apostles and then grow again to 12 with the introduction of Paul uh, a little later. And it'll be up to these 12 men to, to bring you and me around a camera this morning in my dining room. And it worked. Um, we'll take a look at, at those things as well, um, the things that we have seen and hope to see at First Christian Church, um, kind of towards the end of this message. Today's parable is one of responsibility, too, and purposeful work for the kingdom of God. Uh, clothed in the form of a nobleman traveling to a distant country, leaving some of his servants responsible for the continued growth of his property, this teaching really speaks to us today and what we're doing to continue bringing the kingdom of God close to others. Jesus has gone away, if you will, to heaven to receive his kingdom that he paid for in his blood. Meanwhile, he expects us to be actively working on the continual growth of his kingdom until he returns. And that really is what that parable is speaking about, I believe, and we'll see that um, more clearly here in a minute. <clears throat> this idea of, you know, being responsible and actively at work, um, bringing the kingdom of God near to other people, reminds me of one of my favorite passages of scripture, and really the passage of scripture I want to um, focus on as the theme uh, verse, if you will, today, which is Joshua twenty four fifteen, where it says, choose for yourselves today who you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I probably should have cued Rob Baker to that. Rob, if you're watching, sorry about that. But we're not playing music today anyway. But uh, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This is such a great song. I remember singing that new in my faith when I was first at First Christian 20 years ago. So turn with me now over to Luke 19, verses 11 through 27. And let's travel through this passage together, shall we? I'm just going to read it through first fairly quickly. So verse 11 says, while they were listening to these things that Jesus was preaching about, Jesus went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. So he said, 
A nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. And he called ten of his slaves and gave them ten minus and said to them, Do business with this until I come back. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, We don't want this man to reign over us. And when he returned after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that these slaves to whom he had given the money be called to him so that he might know what business they had done. And the first appeared saying, Master, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good slave. Because you've been faithful in a very little thing, you're to be in authority over ten cities. The second came saying, Your mina master has made five minas. And he said to him also, And you are to be over five cities. Another man came saying, Master, here's your mina, which I kept put away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you, because you're an exacting man. You take up what you did not lay down, and you reap what you did not sow. And the master said to him, By your own words I'll judge you, you worthless slave. Did you know that I'm an exacting man, taking up what I did not lay down, and reaping what I did not sow? Then why did you put my money in the bank, and having come, I would have collected it with interest? Then he said to the bystanders, Take the mina away from him, and give it to the one who has the ten minas. And they said to him, Master, he, he has ten minas already. I tell you, said the master, that to everyone who has, more shall be given. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. But these enemies of mine, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. It's a great place to end, right? Can you imagine Jesus saying this in a parable? But he was really speaking to a few things. So let me go just quickly through that passage again and point out a few things. So if you go to verse 12, it says, so he said, Jesus said, as he started this parable, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. And this is, this is Jesus teaching us that he knows that the future, just a few days, about a week from now, from when he's speaking this, he is going to be going to a distant country. He is that nobleman. And that distant country is heaven. And he's going to receive a kingdom for himself that he bought with his own blood. And that's the kingdom of God. That's, that's his people. That's us. And many other things. But he also says he's going to return. And we know that he will return again. He's been speaking over the last couple of weeks that we've been reading and studying on Sundays. He's been speaking and illuminating this idea, resting on the idea that he will return again for uh, us someday. And that will be a time of judgment. And he called, it says to th in verse 13, he called to 10 of his slaves. And I, I do want you to understand that these are servants. They use a term slave here that in our modern vernacular should probably be translated servants. So we're not um, confused, but um, it was, con they were called slaves back then, but it was again indentured servants. So it was people that just couldn't make a living on their own. And so they uh, would hire themselves out like we would in our jobs they would hire themselves out to uh, work for the owner. And usually it would be a lifetime service, uh, or it would be a certain amount of years of service in return for a certain resource like place to live or you know, a wage or whatever. And then they could choose to renew that or not. And if they wanted to, remember the Old Testament teaching was if they wanted to re res uh, continue on as a master's slave, um, they would actually um, ask them to put their ear against a doorpost and make a mark in their ear to just basically indicate that they're um, someone who loved their master enough to want to stay with him. Um, so it was a, quite a bit different than the way we think of slavery, obviously, in today's <coughs> world or in the past, re, our recent history. And so that's important to remember as you're reading through this. But in, he also says in, in 13 that he wants us to do business with this, the minas that he's given in this case, until he comes back. And for us, he's really telling us that he wants us to be about his business, bringing the kingdom of God near to people 
um, until he gets back. He's not a God that's interested in money. He's a God that's interested in his people. And so he wants us to work and to be people that are concerned for each other. Remember he says elsewhere that the greatest commandments are, yes, to love him is the number one, but to love God. But the second greatest one is to love each other. And before he leaves in Luke 13, as we read about uh, six chapters ago, he says, I give you a new commandment that as I have loved you, go and love one another. And that's a tall order. I mean, if you think about it, um, even just this morning, um, I had people contacting me with tensions over COVID, um, over COVID mandates, over, you know, all these things. But the important thing here is to be working on spreading the gospel, that it, none of this stuff really matters. If you look out your windows, if you can, from where you are, I encourage you to, if you look out your windows, I'm looking over here out mine, you can see, you know, the trees are still there. The grass is green because God's been sending a lot of rain. It's raining right now here at my house, and it's beautiful outside. Uh, last night, uh, we had coyotes howling, and I've seen turkeys walking across the street as, I've, uh, as I went in and out of our, our community here. It's still beautiful outside. The world continues. It, it knows nothing about COVID. And so these tensions are important and they're real, but we have to remember the reality that lurks underneath them, that God is still in control, that we're still his people, and we're called to still love each other any way that we can. And I'm working on that. I'm not the perfect person at that either because I'm just a person. But as I work on that in my own self, I just encourage you to work in it um, in your own self. You know, I was thinking this morning as I was talking to someone about Paul's teaching about the weaker brother, um, and we would say, or sister, that it's really about looking out for those people. We may have positions and ideas uh, in our own minds about the way we want things to happen or the way things should be. But what's most important is looking out for those that are weaker in the faith than us, or including having no faith at all, and try and understand what will reach them the best for the gospel. Because that is the only thing that matters ultimately in the world. <clears throat> and he does say down in verse 15 to remember that he is going to return and there's going to be an accounting. And if you're wondering about that minus thing, um, just know that that's, uh, it's not really clear, but in today's world, it would be equivalent to about three months of earnings. And so it's a lot. If he gave the one guy 10 minus, he gave him 30 months, almost three years worth of your salary to do something with. So he's not just giving a little teeny bit. He's giving a significant thing um, to invest in people with. And he's given us a significant thing as well, which is him to invest in other people, his gospel. We have, he sent his Holy Spirit to dwell inside of us, right? Not just to come and go, to visit and hang out and then leave, but to indwell in each of us so that we may have a clear and constant communication with him. And that communication is this parable, to go and spread the gospel at any cost for anyone anywhere and anyhow and that's what finds us this morning in my dining room <laughs> and uh let's see what else do i have here you know the one guy uh that poor guy who knew that this particular master was really uh, exerting some pressure uh, so he just folded up his one mina and stuck it in a handkerchief and you know uh, kept it until the guy got back so at least he could say i didn't lose any money well, you know, Jesus was kind of harsh with him, too, because we have, given, we have been given this great treasure of Jesus inside of us, right? And he doesn't want us to just hold on to it and hold it inside. He wants us to go out and reproduce that treasure in other people. Now, we can't bring anybody to faith. That is absolutely not doable or our job. <clears throat> That's clear throughout Scripture. But what we can do is we can plant a seed of faith in people. We can we can water that faith uh, a little bit, but God has to make it grow, right? But we are held accountable to do that. A seed, even in that metaphor um, that we're planting, that seed remains a seed until it's planted. There's no life 
It's just a seed. It's, it's the possibility of life. It's, it's the potential of life in that seed that's amazing. And I'm a nature guy, so I, I still um, love the, when we used to, uh, you know, remember when you're in elementary school and they would get a paper towel real wet and put it around a clear glass and then you put seeds between the glass and the paper towel and watch it root and, and grow. I still love that stuff. It still amazes me, God's creative uh, power in the world. But he does want us to be good stewards with that. He doesn't want us to be lazy, to just uh, do this, to just go to church and and uh, be passive even there, or be active and then just call that our faith. He wants us always at work, investing him into his kingdom, which is this world. And he also... Um, you know, he also kind of points out, in a way, if you think about this servant saying this to Jesus, or saying this to the um, landowner, sorry, that I know you're an exacting man. He's basically saying, I know you're a jerk and you're a really tough boss and, and I'm afraid of you. And, and this isn't what Jesus wants from us. Jesus doesn't want fear. He wants honor, you know? It's fear instead of honor that um, isn't good. Um, but fear should at least lead us to action. You know, I really... Uh, hearken back to my, uh, again, to my Jewish roots. I was raised uh, in a Jewish family, and, um, you know, it really was drilled into us. Wisdom begins with the fear and admonition of the Lord, and I've said that many times, probably too many times at First Christian Church, but, and anywhere I've preached, but it's important. I do think a lot of us have lost um, some measure of that. We don't, if we had true fear and admonition of the Lord, we would be, um, mobilizing our lives around that to make sure that we were pleasing him to make sure we were doing what he asked us to do and um, that sense of wisdom beginning with fear and admonition of the lord um, really is wisdom begins with the respect for god and so i want to encourage us as we close out this year and start up a new year to be thinking about that to be thinking about the fact that we should be active in his kingdom in any way that we can. And I know a lot of us are sitting at home and have been sitting at home isolated and saying, well, what can I do? But there's plenty for you to do. You could, you could hit like and comment on this silly live stream feed just to let people rem remember you, to, to bring you to mind, to let them know that you're still involved in this community. Um, these are the things that, that encourage us leaders that we're growing still, and we are, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But you could also be um, sharing these things on your social media feed. You could, you could be bringing Christ to your workplace just in who you are. Again, another thing I repeat too often probably is that St. Francis um, saying that wherever you go, preach the gospel, and when all else fails, use your words. <laughs> and what he means there simply, of course, is just to be... Um, be a Christ in your community. You're not divine, but you carry a spark of the divine inside you. You carry Christ in you, the hope of glory. And at the end, you know, in verse 27, this incredibly harsh passage, but these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. You know, um, that's harsh and that will happen. There is a judgment to come and not everybody wants to think about that. Um, I don't want to think about that, but I do because I know it's an important thing to think about because it's something Jesus has promised me and he's promised you that he will return. And in that fear and admonition of the Lord, the way that works out in my life is I am desperate um, to reach other people, my friends, my family, um, the people around me in any way that I can for Christ not so that I could put a chick mark on my uh, you know, stick or whatever, but I don't care about that at all. What I care about is people not perishing without Christ and ending in hell. That's what I care about, and that'll be harsh. What many commentators feel like he's actually talking to right now, it does happen. Um, these enemies of Jesus's were the Jewish people that would not um, come around to him. The Jewish people that would call out for him to be crucified, right? Um, in verse 14, it says, his citizens hated him. So every person on the earth is a citizen 
uh, of God's because God created every person on this earth. But not everybody follows or likes him. In fact, in verse, in verse 14, he kind of alludes to the fact that some citizens will hate him and send a delegation after him saying, we don't want this guy to reign over us. And the Jewish people were doing that. And so about 34-ish years later, um, under Titus, the um, Roman official there, um, the Romans decided they were done with these troublesome Jewish people. Um, the Jewish people had tried to revolt a few times, and, uh, and the Romans were done. And so they came in, and they sacked Jerusalem, and they destroyed the temple, and they put many of the Jews to death and scattered the Jews out into the world. And it wasn't until recently in 1948 that that came back together as the country of Jerusalem, a tiny, tiny little country in, in the Middle East. But that um, bringing them here and slaying them in his presence really in many ways was fulfilled in 70 AD um, and will be fulfilled again, unfortunately, at the end of all things when Jesus returns. Now, I know this is harsh. This is a harsh passage. In my opinion, this is the harshest thing Jesus ever says or alludes to in Scripture. He's going to get mad after he gets into Jerusalem and throw a couple of tables over. Um, but this is one where he actually calls for the death of people. Um, and that is incredibly harsh. Um, but remember that it's also pretty clear. He's alluding, uh, like I said, to the coming destruction of the temple. Um, but for me, it's just further encouragement to be found actively at work building his kingdom any way that we can, any way that I can, even here in my dining room until he returns. And that's important. I know I, it's kind of fun and I, uh, it's fun for me to say, but it's important. I, I feel that to the core of who I am. And so today's parable is one of really responsibility and purposeful work um, for his property. And my word just freaked out. So hang on just one second. I apologize. <clears throat> this is the beautiful thing about uh, technology is sometimes it just doesn't work. Uh, and so as we keep uh, going through and we keep thinking about our day-to-day -day lives and what we're doing, um, you know, to help build the kingdom of God, I want to encourage you guys all of us. I want to encourage myself first and foremost, but I want to be encouraging you to get out there and to understand that every day, today matters. Today matters that your life and your, your work for the gospel and your, your work at bringing the kingdom of God closer to other people is so important today. We don't know when Christ is going to return. He might return tonight. He might return tomorrow. He might return in a thousand years. But that's the whole point of end times theology is to always be ready. Just always be ready. And how do you be ready? You're investing your life into the kingdom of God. Maybe most of you that are listening right now are saved already. And so you know you're part of the kingdom of God. And maybe a few of you aren't really sure. Maybe you're on the fringes. You got one foot over the border and one foot still in the world. Or maybe some of you are looking on from a distance and like, no, or just like, what is this all about? The only thing that matters is getting people into the kingdom of God. Our lives, our money, our houses, our cars, all of this stuff, while important to us right now, they just don't mean anything in, the, in an eternal sense. Um, when I do remember that we all serve something or someone, that also reminds me of this. You know, that uh, passage in Joshua says that, you know, you can choose which God you want to serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Um, we all are going to serve something. You are serving something right now. And when you go about your business today and tomorrow and Tuesday and uh, February 12th of next year, whatever, you're, you're going to be serving something. You're going to be serving a boss. You're going to be serving your family. You're going to be serving your mortgage payments. You're going to be serving a lot of different things. Um, we all have to choose who we serve. For me, I've 
you know, I'm as materialistic as the next person, but I've, uh, over the last 10 years in particular, I've really made it a goal to quit serving so many other different things and to clear up everything I can to serve the Lord. And it's landed me where I am today, which is, which is hard. Pastoring is a hard job and it's a beautiful job. And it's the only thing I can imagine really doing. But I want my life to matter. Yeah, I want my life to matter to my descendants, but my, and you know, to my friends and family, but my personal accolades fade really quickly against my overwhelming desire to serve my Lord and my Savior, who literally gave everything he had, even his life for me, all to show me the way to actually experiencing and having a better life. Because the truth is, um, this life is far better than any life I was trying to lead on my own. And um, I want to help other people find this way to the love and grace I find in living for Jesus. This is what brings the God, the kingdom of God closer to me. And this is how I bring the kingdom of God to others. And this is why I do what I do. And I call you to do even more than you already do. So what we're talking about do, you know, the Christian faith is not a faith of doing things. It's a faith of being things. But to be something, you got to get stuff done. And so I thought I'd take a moment here and um, just kind of review some of the things that we've done at First Christian Church over this last year to help you be inspired and remember um, the important work that's getting done. And then maybe to dream with you a little bit about um, 2022. And in all of this, I want you to remember that the goal is what Joshua says in uh, chapter 24, verse 15, where he says that to choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So let's look at a couple of things, or let's, I guess you're listening to a couple of things that uh, the church, this house of God has done um, in serving the Lord over this last year. And the first thing we always think about are material things, right, in some ways. And so um, I was thinking back over this last year about some of the huge physical accomplishments we've made. And, um, you know, some of the things that I'm, I'm reminded of is that we, uh, we installed a very extensive um, air scrubbing system. And so we have ionizers up there. We have overkill filters up there. The air that you would normally be breathing in the sanctuary right now is actually rated a higher grade than um, John Muir Walnut Creek because we have the H numbers there. I think they're H22. I forget what that stands for. Or H23 or the other way around. But anyway, we were able, um, because of our controllable environment compared to a hospital, we were able to make our air purer than probably any other air in the county. Uh, we went quite overboard, but we thought that was important for you and for us. And then we also realized that the front parking lot was cracking up a lot. And so uh, we have a huge scouting group, uh, Trail Life and American Heritage Girls, on Monday nights at the church. And if you have uh, children that aren't part of that program, I really encourage you to, to connect with uh, Elderberry and, uh, and learn more about that. We have about 80 kids that show up in, on Mondays uh, at the church and pursue... Um, uh, Boy Scout and Girl Scout kind of badges and learning more focused only on uh, nature and adventure and God. It's a Christian group. And uh, we, we go to some great extents to make sure that's COVID safe. And um, it's really fun. We strangely, uh, last I heard, have the largest um, troop in Northern California in our tiny little church. So that's pretty fun. But they would go out, um, you know, it's Monday evenings and in the winter, like right now, it's dark when they go out. And we had a couple of kids trip, not get hurt, thankfully. So we resurfaced that parking lot to make it safe and we haven't had any trips since. Uh, we've also done a lot of painting and remodeling of the offices and sanctuary, trying to upgrade, uh, update it just a little bit. But also um, the things you don't think about, like making the live stream for you that are online a little easier to view. Um, just kind of making things fresh, turn the front office into a conference room so people can drop in and have a Bible study or talk or sew or whatever. And we've had so many things going on in that front office since we changed it. It's been really fun. Um, 
And then Pat, our, L, our uh, deacon, one of our deacons, has actually just finished completing, with the help of Michael and um, John Leary, a new sound booth. So if you haven't seen that, it's pretty awesome. Pat is an incredibly skilled woodworker. He actually teaches woodshop at, I think, a high school. I'm probably getting that wrong, Pat. I'm sorry. And uh, his skills are phenomenal. And so thank you, Pat, for having done that. That gives us a little distance um, uh, between the all the electronics and the little kids' fingers, and that's been very, very important in this year of technology. And we've done several other things as well. Um, serving those in need in our community, beyond just the physical stuff we've done at the church, this is what really kind of drives um, First Christian Church, which is great. It's great to be a part of. We have uh, two homeless people living in their um, trailers in the alleyway under what's known as a nomadics communities um, homeless outreach. And so the idea there is we are trying to house them, trying to house homeless people for about a year um, in trailers of their own. They don't share trailers where they can have a real bed and a full kitchen and a full bath and a living room place to, you know, a dining room table to sit at where they can um, start to feel um, what it's like to live indoors, to live in a home again. And then over the course of a year, get them stabilized emotionally and physically, doctor's appointments. There's a lot of trauma that goes into being homeless, um, those kinds of things, and then get them into housing. And uh, as that's developed, it's really been the, the same two people there for quite a while, which is good and will be very hard to change because they are our brother and sister <laughs> in many ways. But um, over this next year, we will try and get them into more permanent housing and um, that will allow us to take on um, more uh, people as well. Uh, we also resource the local homeless community. Like I had mentioned at the, right before we started this morning, I had a text from uh, our sister church, Morel Hills and Martinez. And between us, we're trying to equip the local core homeless teams um, with jackets and blankets and socks and hats and shoes only those items because they're not, because of COVID, they can't really take much clothing. Um, but it's made a huge difference uh, for the homeless in the cities of Pleasant Hill and now Martinez this year, because this winter has obviously been good for us, for those in the drought, um, including the homeless, but it's been brutalizing for them because they're in the weather. And so um, we have a local homeless outreach team sent by the county that comes about every week to take everything we have, <laughs> and they do. Um, we also uh, delivered about 42 turkeys to the City Impact Mission in San Francisco in the Tenderloin District, where I do some ministry there preaching, or I did before COVID, and I'm kind of hankering to return lately, especially. Um, but we were able to help them provide thousands of Thanksgiving meals to the homeless in the Tenderloin District uh, again this year. It's the second time we've done that, or third. I think it's the second. And we've really increased, in, in COVID, we've really increased the care of people that are isolated, especially the elderly, but also just those in need, running errands, taking a doctor's appointments, getting groceries, taking them to the bank, whatever the needs are, we scramble to fulfill those. And that's, uh, that's good. And then finally, and more, most importantly, is uh, what we've done in faith, you know, trying to grow ourselves in faith that will reach out and grow our community as well. And so we, we continue to send out these messages. We continue to try and do those in person in a safe way when we can. <laughs> uh, the elders have been, we have been working on a mission statement for the church, uh, updating and uh, creating a new one. And of course, uh, Elderberry continues to uh, hold a Sermon 2.0 uh, small groups on Wednesday evenings that dive deeper into the messages like this one that I preach that I intentionally do not attend. So you can feel free to say any and everything about uh, any message I deliver, which I personally feel is very important. Um, we've done a tremendous amount of counseling um, and helping people in crisis over these last two years. And this year was no different. Um, I would say about a third of my work week is now filled up with counseling people. And that's okay. I'm glad to be there for them. Um, but this pandemic has taken a toll on people mentally. And we're trying to, um, you know, often trying to talk people off the cliff. 
and uh, just trying to help people stay s as stable and sane as we all can during this during this uh, situation. And I'm happy to say that everybody has. We haven't had any tragedies that way, um, and so that's good too. And then, of course, thanks to Michael Balachi and John Leary um, and others, our global online connections just continue to increase. I was saying um, to my future son-in-law this morning that you know we're even being viewed out of Africa and uh, Papua New Guinea and other areas, and maybe that's you uh, this morning. Maybe you could say good morning from wherever you are in the comment feed. That would be really fun, and we would be tickled pink to, to hear from you. That's a uh, weird American saying that probably only us old people know. All right, so that is 2021. And let me just uh, quickly go through some dreams we have for 2022. Now, um, to, to be honest, uh, the offerings, the givings uh, over this last year have understandably dropped off quite a bit as we're all struggling to uh, survive and do what we can under COVID pressures. And so a lot of what we dream for this next year are dreams of faith. We are not able to budget for most of this because we're not able to budget for most of our budget. Um, we're doing good. I don't want to give you the wrong impression. We could go on doing what we're doing right now indefinitely. Uh, we're doing that well. But we like to do more. We're always looking to do more. You know, that guy with the 10 and the 5 and the other one with the 5 minus, you know, they... They invested what little they had. It wasn't even theirs, it was the owner's. And uh, the owner blessed them for that. And we're just trying to follow that pattern. So in 2022, some of the things that um, we've dreamed about uh, physically doing at the church could be some more possible interior repainting. Um, could also be, uh, I, I was in a church service, uh, a funeral service a few months ago where they had extended their stage out to the side and built a little living room and, and had uh, everybody that wanted to connected by Zoom on the big TV in the living room on the stage. And that was cool because you could see other people that weren't physically in attendance right there and they could interact. And so I've, I've been kind of trying to turn that around. Like, could we do that at First Christian Church? I'd love to get more in uh, connection with those of you who have to be at home uh, for safety. Also, um, as uh, Michael and John have pointed out, you know, the acoustics in our church uh, or any building that has a lot of hard surfaces just isn't good. Sound bounces around off of hard surfaces. So we're looking at possible uh, inexpensive but good looking ways of putting some acoustical enhancements in the sanctuary. And I would like to expand that out to the fellowship hall. Um, also, I, as I look out my office windows, I see that I have neglected the gardening in our Garden of Grace. It still looks okay, but um, it could flourish a little bit more. So I'm hoping maybe the spring and summer, if you're a gardening nut, you might join me and we'll have a couple of days or evenings or Saturdays or Sundays after church or something. We'll just get out there and, and plant some flowers together and enjoy each other's company in the sun. Um, and I've also had the dream of maybe uh, putting clear lights around the, the five, I think, trees we have in our parking lot, um, solar lights, so they don't need the electricity, and just so they would light up in the evening to provide more light for people that are here, but also to, uh, you know, draw attention to the facility by people that are driving by. Uh, just something else I've seen in other churches that's really pretty. Um, and then with our ongoing homeless program, that occurs in the alley next to the church, and we're hoping to beautify that a little bit so it looks better and to give um, the people that are living there a little more privacy. So those are some of the physical dreams we have. Uh, many of those, like I said, are not, none of them are budgeted for, and so they have to happen as generosity increases or as people uh, like myself and maybe some of you step forward and say, hey, I'd like to help fund this one particular project. Um, for We continue to look for ways to help people that are in need. That's what First Christian is about. That's where really our, our strength is lately, is just um, really looking out for people that, that need someone to look out for them. You know, I'm constantly thinking in my head that true religion begin, is this, taking care of widows and orphans in their distress. And so... Um, we try and do that, and the more people that step out and try and, and help us do that, the more people can be helped. Some of you out there know you've connected with me or others, and we're not always available, and that can be frustrating sometimes, but it's because we have such a limited 
amount of people doing it. So if you like helping people in need in some way, I know um, uh, our own Sue Bertoff, a recent member, um, has expressed wanting to do this. Maybe there's some of you out there that want to know what some of the needs are in our community that you could help with maybe. But we're officially beginning the Nomadic Community Year of Care towards housing. Um, in my mind, that's January 1st. So when I created that nonprofit organization, um, I did create a, a contract, an intake form. I was just thinking as a county worker, an intake form, a contract of conduct and all kinds of things and just kind of an intentional year of care towards a vision of housing specifically permanent housing off campus to allow us to um, bring in more people to to help. Um, so we'll be getting that. Um, we also are hoping, I'm hoping to expand that nomadic community system. It's never intended to just be at First Christian Church. That can help two people at a time. If we can get 20 churches doing it, it could help 40 to 50 people at a time which is half of the population and uh, homeless population in Pleasant Hill on any given day. So the church could make a huge impact on the city. It costs our city of Pleasant Hill about uh, over $70,000 a year right now per homeless person to take care of them. That's, that's ambulance needs, psych emergency, hospitals, um, you know, just police calls, jail time, all of that stuff, um, $70,000 of our tax paying money going to the city every single year for each person. So you can imagine if the churches could um, actually just not only care for these people in meaningful ways, we could actually all, as well save the city millions of dollars. And so, and it's not about Pleasant Hill, it's about doing this everywhere. And so I hope to see that expand. There's a system built into the Nomadic Communities nonprofit org that um, expands it out to other faith campuses anywhere and um, creates a network of uh, leaders at each campus that network together and share best practices and encourage each other and support hospital runs and all that kind of stuff. So I'm hoping to see that expand out a little this year. Um, we're also American Heritage Girls and Trail Life. They do projects that are equivalent to the Boy Scout Eagle Scout projects. And um, so we've benefited from a lot of those projects from the scout hosting the scouts. Um, we've got benches out front of our main doors that were built by uh, Trail Life. We've got a our basement was refinished, repainted and, and uh, all the lighting fixtures updated by an American Heritage Girl project. And this year, in January actually, it's already plotted out, um, there's an American Heritage Girl project that will build and irrigate a community food garden outside of the pastoral offices in the alley on top of the large rocks that are there. We're really excited about that because it will help feed the homeless but it, and um, we can send that out to the food bank and it can also help um, feed some of those in need in our own community, which is really cool. The nice thing about these projects is it costs us nothing. That That's part of the, the Eagle Scoutish type of project is that they have to come up with the funding and everything. And I happen to know that uh, the community garden is fully funded already. So they've done a wonderful job. So be looking for that garden over the next couple of, of months. Um, I know Susan... Peterson and Kathy Swan, you've been out there gardening off and on quite a bit, so uh, get ready to plant some veggies. It'll be a lot of fun. Um, we're also looking at surveying some local greater community needs. How can we help uh, people in our community uh, with the gospel? I don't know what that looks like, but maybe you do and can add, offer some suggestions, but we're always looking to expand um, care for other people. That's what Jesus calls us to do, to love others as he has loved us. And um, we've increased our missionary support and we actually did budget for this. So we ask people to consider um, working up to offering, uh, giving uh, monetarily to their local church about 10%. That's the Old Testament tithing system, which we're no longer under. Jesus actually just asked us to give everything. Um, but, you know, a 10% thing is a, is a good goal. And so we're trying to do that as well as, a, as an organization and, um, and as a church organism. And so we're trying to work up to giving 10% of our um, 
income uh, every year to missions to again draw the kingdom of God closer to people all over the world. I think we're at about 3% right now of our budget and uh, we've kind of determined even though the budget's tight that's one thing we wouldn't give up because it's so important to us and so we're increasing that to about 4%, uh, 1% each year to try and absorb that and we're pretty excited about I believe God will bless us through that. And then finally, and really most excitingly for me, and maybe for you, even if you're online, even in Africa, is that uh, is the how we're going to grow in faith over this next year. Um, I say that because we have some intentional in-person and Zoom potential uh, discipleship courses beginning maybe in January. Uh, I hope in January. So these are classes that uh, we have a introduction or foundations of faith class that's quite um, extensive and really great six-week course and we have a uh, developing discipleship habits course another six-week course and then we have a course on the history of the restoration movement our church is a is a restoration movement based church and um, john mckillen is an incredible historian and uh, intelligent man I just can't say enough I mentor under him in my opinion and um, he's gonna help lead that uh, six-week course after the first two so and then we have others coming we're hoping to be able to do that in person uh, maybe after service on Sundays we're not sure yet you could comment below if there was a particular time that worked great for you um, but we also hope to include anybody that wants to attend by zoom I could put this webcam on my laptop just like this and um, and uh, with a zoom meeting you could talk back and we could see and talk to you um, and so maybe we'd be able to do that it'd be a lot of fun we're trying to expand what we can do for those of you who are you know kind of caught at home uh, due to safety concerns we're also uh, obviously have already expanded the children's ministry and we're going to focus this next year on youth ministry even before we even really have youth there um, again through the scouts and american heritage girls there's potential that there are unchurched people there and and then just as families attend and then um our own linda baker not to put you on the spot linda but when they rob and linda started attending one of the first questions she had is do we have a seniors ministry and it made me start thinking well gosh i guess i'm a senior now we should get that going <laughs> but it did make me think oh you know seniors uh do have a lot of different needs and so i'm hoping maybe we'll be able to look at ways to reach out and love and support some of the elderly in our community too and by elderly i mean anybody that feels old um, it doesn't matter what your tree rings say um, but there's so there's a lot of opportunity there's many other things but i want to challenge you with this as we as i wrap up today finally and see what happens when I get to be online and no one's stopping me, we've gone an hour. Um, but I do wanna wrap up and, and say, um, none of this happens without you, or very little of this happens without you. We can, we can design courses and offer them, but they don't do anything if you don't attend them. They don't do anything for you, and they don't do anything for people you might invite along with you. Um, and they don't always encourage us in doing them, right? We can, we can try and form a youth ministry, but nothing happens with that if you aren't inviting families, if you aren't bringing your own children, if you aren't making church a priority for yourself. We can, um, we can try all these projects with the homeless and shut-in care and community vegetable gardens, but if it's just two or three people doing all of that, very little gets done. You know, uh, at one point, the Gospels tell us that the harvest is plentiful, um, but the workers are few. And really, the only thing that holds back the advancement of the kingdom of God is the amount of people working to advance it. And so one thing that I believe we have great potential in at First Christian Church that has not really been tapped yet is you, is your involvement. And I'm asking for three things in, in 2022 as we start to think towards New Year's resolutions. I'm asking you to resolve to think about Joshua 24, 15, where it says, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. Who are you going to serve in 2022? 
Are you only going to serve your boss? Are you only going to serve your family? Are you only going to serve your mortgage? Those things are important. But are those the only things that you'll serve because they take up so much time to serve? And I hope many of us will grab on to the second half of that verse, which says, but as for me and my house, let's say for us and First Christian Church, we will serve the Lord. And I want you to consider ways in 2022 that you might build your own faith. I'm actually asking you to do something somewhat selfish, uh, is to build your own faith. Do whatever you feel needs to be done to do that. Attend a course, attend these messages. Pray more, read your Bible more. But also, remember it wasn't just about putting the minus in a handkerchief. It was about investing that minus and bringing in a greater return on that investment. And for us, it's not just about holding Christ within us, the hope of glory, but to show that hope to the world. And we only do that as we live it out ourselves first. And so there's three things I want to ask you to do or consider to do in 2022. The first is always to uh, make church attendance a priority wherever you're going to church. There's just nothing like being in fellowship with a group of Christians for support, for encouragement, for spurring one another along in our faith. You just can't replace that in your own home. This is a very different experience for me this morning uh, over being at church in person with, you know, 30 of you. Um, I'm encouraged because I'm encouraged about this coming year and I'm encouraged about our church family, but I'd be more encouraged if I also was able to, to shake your hand, to see your eyes, to uh, feel your energy, to sing and worship with you. And so make church uh, attendance a priority in 2022. And, and that doesn't have to be in person, but if you're online, I actually have a very, uh, a very heartfelt ask from you too. And it's easy to accomplish, but I can't, I can't express how much it means to me. And that is just simply to at least hit like whenever you view these messages and preferably leave a comment. I treasure those. And I know many of our leaders and many of our church family does. I go back and read them after every message. And um, I comment on some of them. I love some of them. They all make me smile. Uh, it often leads me to prayer for you. Um, it just is the fellowship we can't otherwise have. And so my challenge to those of you attending online, is wherever you're attending online, um, is to hit that like button and, and make a comment and be part, an active part of the service. The second thing I would encourage you to do is to attend a course when they're offered. These are how we grow. Uh, I'm, I'm so excited about these courses just because, not about doing them, that's just a lot of work, but about you who might go through them. And, and yeah, I think about my own experiences of sitting in a class that I was like, I know all this stuff already, blah, 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 blah. Whoa, and then having that massive moment that expanded my faith. And there were very, you know, not very few of those, but there were some of those, very few that were pivotal in my life, but would not have led me to be a pastor if I hadn't experienced them. Um, and so they're just so critical to attend these courses and we'll be offering them any way that we can. And then third and finally, um, to serve somewhere, serve anywhere. Just do something active with your faith. There are there are some things you can do down at the church, yes. You can, you can paint, you can garden, you can uh, sign up to help with the audio video if you're a tech person. There are, there's a million things you could do. But the most important thing you could do is just to be active in your faith everywhere that you are. Um, and that doesn't mean like it's too easy just to say, oh, I'm a Christian, I am active everywhere I am, but actually be doing something. When you finish a day and, and uh, just reviewing as you're praying maybe or as you're, as you're spending some quiet time with that cup of coffee or whatever you have at the evening, just like, what did I do with the Lord today? What have we done together today, Lord? And let that spur you on, not in a guilt sense, but in a fear and admonition sense, in a respect for the Lord. And remember the men with the minas. And maybe ask yourself, which man am I? Which woman am I? 
Again, this isn't a guilt trip. This is about fulfilling your faith and then bringing others to faith themselves. So I hope you have enjoyed as best you can this message. It's been strange for me, but good. I'm desperate um, to reach you for the Lord and I'm desperate for other people to be reached as well. I don't always do it well. I don't always do the right things. I could do other things as well. I'm just desperate to do anything to bring people to the Lord, to, to help the weaker brother and sister become stronger, to, to care for that person that's isolated or sick or angry at home in any way that I can, because as Jesus loved me, I want to love you as well. And so help me do that in 2022. Let me pray for you. Father God, I just, I thank you for this day. And I thank you for, for your word and your encouragement. I thank you for making through another year of this craziness. Two full years of COVID now, Father. But you're in control. And the world is still spinning. And it's still beautiful outside. And you are still a good Lord and a good Savior and our only God and Lord and Savior. We thank you for being that. We thank you for loving us. Help us to love other people and love you more every day. And especially as we go into 2022, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week, everybody. And we'll see what happens next Sunday. So keep alert uh, on your emails and your Facebook posts. All right. Love you guys. Bye-bye.